Excellent. All right, well, hello and welcome to the NetLease Beast. Today we have a very exciting conversation with a very accomplished and valuable individual in the world of commercial real estate, Mr. Blaine Strickland. Blaine is a longtime commercial real estate expert with over 40 years of experience in the field. He's a best selling author, speaker, and coach, and has a long track record of taking real estate professionals who are often already successful and moving them higher toward a level of effectiveness. We're very excited to have Blaine with us today. And uh, Blaine, I'm very excited for this conversation. I read your first book, Thrive, uh, for the first time, I think a year or two ago, and it really did completely shift my mindset towards my business. You have a concept which you refer, refer to as your top 125, which uh, at its core is a, a framework that allows a real estate professional like myself to take a more targeted and calculated approach towards the relationship building aspect of the commercial real estate brokerage business. So uh, just to get us started here, tell us a little bit more about yourself, your journey, and where that has all brought you today. Well, thank you, Landon. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invite. I guess the quick background on me is that because my father was a, a fighter pilot in Vietnam, when we came back to the United States, he was stationed at McDill Air Force Base and at age 44 decided that you know, after moving all over the world and lots of moves, let's stay here. What's wrong with this picture? So we set up camp many, many years ago in Central Florida, which caused me to transfer to the University of Florida to take advantage of their real estate program, which I did because my father was leaving the Air Force and going into real estate. So I graduated a long time ago with degrees, undergraduate and graduate degrees in real estate from the University of Florida, which makes me a fairly rare bird these days, only because there were so few programs way back then. Um, so, uh, 10 years with CBRE in uh, two markets in Florida, 10 years really learning the development business, working with very large companies and very large projects, 10 years of working on my own projects, um, raising the money, managing the properties, leasing the properties, asset managing the properties, and then really the last 10 years have been focused on being a coach. Both my father and my grandfather were sports coaches um, in different parts of their lives. So I think I must have that gene. Uh, what I find today is it puts me in a situation where I've had a lot of different roles in my 40 year history in the industry. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm old enough to have a lot of experiences and young enough to still care. And so um, I really like the role that I'm in now. And uh, it's been fun to uh, build this coaching platform over the last 10 years. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about that platform you're building right now. So um, there are a lot of different coaching styles. Um, some are focused on public speaking and off-the-shelf type products. Some are focused on um, accountability type programs, you know, every other Tuesday for the rest of your life. I remain as a really a, a small company focused on what I would call specialized consulting. And so for me, what that means is I probably only work with about 20 or 25 people per year, but I tend to have in-depth assignments with them. Um, the book Thrive has a subtitle of 10 prescriptions for exceptional performance. The word prescription flows from my writing coach saying, when I said to my writing coach, you know, people call me when they're in pain, they hire me when they're in acute pain. He clicked onto that and said, that's interesting. What, what do you mean by pain? And so we made a list of something like 20 pains and picked out the top 10. And that's what led to the book. So when you read the book, mm. you really get a sense for my coaching world that this is, I'm like a doctor who serves these pains. Wow. Yeah. So, so man, that's a lot of experience and you've been doing this for quite some time and you've got somewhat of a unique perspective that not many people have in which you've been on the brokerage side of the business development, um, leasing, and now coaching. So you've seen it from really all angles. Now, uh, you, you did a fantastic job of outlining the impetus behind Thrive and the structure there. So walk me through how the world of commercial real estate and specifically brokerage has changed in your lifetime. Well, sometimes I like to quote uh, Bob Knackle, who's a top investment sale broker um, in New York City and been there a long time, very well known. And he made a very interesting comment about a year and a half ago on a webinar that I heard. And and Bob, like me, is in his 60s. And, you know, there's a lot of us that are the same age, um, SIOR, CCIM, NAR, National Association of Realtors, all would point to an average age of sort of 60-ish, which is kind of frightening to think about 
when you have a large group of people, when the average age is 60, normally you would be in senior housing if you said that. And so it's kind of interesting to think of it that way, like come visit the commercial real estate arena. It's sort of like being in senior housing. And so that immediately gives you some sense that in a lot of ways, things haven't changed that much. Bob made this comment. He said, no, we're, we're still doing the same thing we were doing 40 years ago. We're selling the same properties. Um, so it's not like a new thing. We're doing the same thing. It's, we're doing it at the same commission rate. We're not getting a greater commission rate. We're getting the same commission rate. It's just that the buildings are worth 10 and 20 times what they were 40 years ago. And so where we used to make $100,000 a year in commission, we now make $10 million a year in commission. And if you think about that only as a case study, land, and just think about that. If I said to you, hey, I could put you in an industry where you could do the same thing for 40 years, but make 10, 20, 50, 100 X over that 40 years, what motivation would there be to change? Uh, I can't think of any. So, so I guess that so that's what's into- happened is that the system has stayed consistent enough and at these much higher real estate prices that there hasn't been a huge motivation to change. If you master the program, then you can make money. And and I've seen that. I mean, I'm in the industry as well. There's a lot of money moving around on a daily <clears> basis. <throat> Why then is the average age from your uh, data 60 years old? Why aren't there more young individuals coming into the industry trying to chase that dollar? Well, that's, that's the question of the day. Um, Many of the large company, your company, as an example, I've been in conversation with your um, HR and learning people, as an example, and they, like other large companies, are trying to figure out how do we how do we bring new people into the business? How do we become more diverse? Not only is it old, it's old and white and male. And so um, how can we make that different? And uh, you know, which is a benefit. In other words, we would benefit from younger people, more diverse people. We need that as an industry, and yet we're not doing a very good job. There's many reasons for that. Number one, as women and minorities have come into the professional world, begun to be a larger and larger part of the college education process. You know, there's more women getting commercial. Um, there's more women getting college degrees today than men. Yeah. Well, as they come into the professional world and the world of this higher education. Many times they seek to be professionals, doctors, attorneys, accountants. Um, And and so the opportunity to be a real estate broker doesn't feel like a very high call for them. I point that out in um, ADAPT, the second book that I wrote, that if you look at all of the commercial real estate programs across the country, um, NAOP created a list and has about 100 universities on it that have some kind of commercial real estate program. Very few of those people are going into brokerage. They're going, they're becoming developers, they're becoming planners, they're becoming designers, they're becoming, they join construction companies or they join financial institutions, banks, REITs, et cetera. Now they're associated with real estate, but they're not brokers like we are. And so that's just a factor that we have to think about. I would tell you, and I make this point and thrive that the one of the big challenges is, is we have a very, very poor onboarding program. We, what we say to people is welcome aboard. Um, it's a very low barrier to entry. Come on in. It's hundred percent commission and you eat what you kill and we hope it goes well. Um, so that isn't the kind of onboarding program. And I personally think it's getting worse. If you're 24 years old and you have an undergraduate degree, maybe a graduate degree, and we say, come on in hundred percent commission, eat what you kill, but we'll give you a 70, 30 split. That isn't a substitute for a business plan. And they compare right. that to $75,000, $90,000 of starting pay at Wells Fargo. And so they're like, which if I'm at Wells Fargo, then I can see that my peers are three, four years ahead of me. They're making $125,000 and they've gone from assistant VP to senior VP. And you may or may not like that track, but it's a clearly defined track. Whereas we're like, eh, you know, you might make it, you might not. Yeah, and, uh, and you're right. The attrition rate is pretty high. Do you think that the natural attrition rate in commercial real estate is part of the reason why a lot of these firms aren't willing to make more of an investment into their new agents? Hard to say. Um, You know, if you were to go to the Career Resource Center at a university, you would find that some of the large life insurance companies uh, are aggressive hirers of business graduates. And a very large one that you would know the name of, you would recognize the name. 
they admittedly hire 20 people and expect only one to make it. And they're okay with that. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I would still, I would still say that they have additional training and, and, um, but many times it's hard for young people to sell life insurance because many of the people who want to buy it are much older. And it's like, you're not any older than my child. Why, you know, so, so that does still happen that there's a big washout rate in some, in some ways. I think the challenge that we have is that uh, we're not only weak on the entry program, we're actually weak on the mentoring program, meaning that someone says, well, now, why would I let this junior associate mirror me or be alongside me? And I would maybe share information with them, and then they might become a competitor. And so we haven't cracked that code. And as a result, mm -hmm. um, many of the mentors are indifferent to the mentoring process. Absolutely. And I've seen that myself. Let's switch gears for a second. So in your newest book, Adapt, you outline some key topics and ideas about how the industry is changing today. Now, earlier you mentioned that this industry is what it is today because of the fact that it's been so um, consistent for such a long period of time. But how is that changing today? And then what was the need that you saw in the market that signaled you to the need to write this book and why now? Well, that's a great question. I had a funny experience when I wrote the first book uh, and, and I had a coach for that process. And what the coach said to me at that time was write a book that needs to be written, that there's a call in the marketplace for this, that, that this will be not just interesting, but it'll be compelling. People will want to see what the message is and, and, and integrate that. So if you can't find that, don't write. If you can find a compelling reason, then, then write, write to that need, figure out the avatar and solve their problem. So when I produced the first book, I took it to a friend and I asked for his opinion and he goes, yeah, it's good. It's good. And um, he said, you know, Blaine, I've worked around you. I, I know you have this coaching gene and, and you're a good writer and you know, I think you expressed yourself well and, you know, congratulations. And I said, wow, that seems like such a lukewarm uh, reaction. And he goes, well, it's just kind of funny because you're getting, you're writing a book that has 40 year old guidance in it. And that's true. And that a lot of the guidance that's in that book really comes from where I started years and years earlier when there was more coaching, more support. There were non-producing managers that assisted you. And I sprinkled in things that I've learned in the way that I believe that top performers benefit from certain practices. All good. And so, but that comment that I was selling 40-year-old guidance really, you know, was like a the irritant that creates a pearl, which is I began, began to think, wow. Um, what is going on out there? What is going to change? And so I made, a, again, under the auspices of coach, made a list of factors that were interior to the arena. So I do not speak to changes in technology or uh, terrorism or global pandemics because those affect all of us. In other words, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. You're going to be driving an autonomous car. Um, autonomous cars will be in the third world by the time you're my age. So so I didn't address that. I tried to think in terms of what's inside our industry. And that's what the second book is about, the nine forces that I think are inherent to our industry, to our arena. And by that, I mean commercial real estate. Here are things that are going to change. Let me just give you two real quick examples. Would that be valuable, Landon? To, to yeah, give a couple quick I think examples? so. Please do. Okay. Well, here's one, which is that when I started, um, I had all the information. In other words, the information was hard to get. It was many times based on experience. But Landon, if I were your client today, I can subscribe to CoStar. I can subscribe to Nexi and RealNex. I can subscribe to crime databases. I can subscribe to hazardous material databases. I can subscribe to Zillow. So by the time you and I meet, it's like, what are you going to do for me? I already have that information. And if you're not careful, you'll end up meeting with clients who knew more than you do. Mm -hmm. Never happened a long time ago because the only the, the information was so nuanced and so hidden that the many times the only way you got the information is you would have to represent let's say a tenant in the marketplace and get proposals from five different owners well there there was no co-star in those days so it wasn't like anybody could know what their marketing that vacant space was i know because i took a tenant there last month and i'm one of the 15 people on the planet that knows what that space is worth so the, the transparency that's been created by the available information to the clients means, 
hey, you may not want to change, but your client is totally, totally different now. That client has totally different information, skills, access. And so you can say, no, I'm good, but it won't be long until they can do the deal without you. There's one whole chapter in the book about 10x. And it's not so much that I'm in love with 10x. I am not. What I'm stunned by is that commercial real estate could be sold by auction. The whole time that I grew up in the industry, auctions were only used for tract housing at best. Here's 100 mm -hmm. houses that are exactly the same, and you're just picking out which lot and block you want. Many auctions in the commercial real estate world, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, if you'd said auction in commercial real estate, what they would have thought of is, oh, you're going to auction off all of your warehouse material or your trucks or your plant or your equipment, not so much the real estate. Well, now the information is so good that a buyer can calmly and safely go to 10X, collect an incredible amount of information and make the deal directly. Um, the seller puts the property on 10X because 10X has taken the effort to qualify the capability of the buyer. So when you, you can't even make an offer unless you're qualified to do that, mm -hmm. well, that's all new. That's all new. And so the capabilities of the players in the market is so much different than it was before that things are going to change whether you want to or not. Uh, yeah, and I've seen that. As a matter of fact, I did a conversation yesterday with some of the folks at Crexy for their podcast, and they had a busy day because yesterday was one of their auction days, and they said that they had $22 billion worth of qualified bids coming through their platform that day, which you know, I have no idea how that compares to the scale of a typical auction or how it compares to 10x, but that's a tremendous amount of dollars going through a platform that you know, most brokers, at least in my shoes, uh, aren't familiar with. I've never used an auction platform, bought or sold on it. So um, I think that's really interesting. And you mentioned, you mentioned 10X, which is a great, uh, it's, it's a great platform out there, which is a relatively new platform in the grand scheme of things. So what are some other new technologies or new changes that have been made available to the commercial real estate industry in the last 10 years that you think are really noteworthy? Well, I think one, uh, there's a whole chapter dedicated to the, what's called the gig economy in ADAPT, yeah. the, the idea of gig workers. And I think we are seeing the viability, the validity of the gig worker in what's happening right now, which is 18 months ago, we told everybody to stop coming in. And so they began to work at home. They were working on computers ex excessively. Now, maybe there was people that they just simply couldn't do as much work or, or maybe because they were already there, they investigated other ideas. But I think the presence of opportunity to make money on the gig economy in the gig economy changes what the labor force looks like for our industry. In other words, if two years ago you were the marketing coordinator for your office and so you were roughly responsible for the activities of, let's say, eight agents, and they wanted, you, you were the centerpiece of creating the flyers and the OMs and getting on the website. And so you were trying to get that done on a templated basis so that there was consistency and quality. And then you're pulled out of that. And maybe at that point, all of that communication becomes remote or virtual. Well, once you make that little leap, then why wouldn't I hire someone else to do that work. What if I went to Upwork and I saw mm -hmm. here is um, Rebecca who has done 42 jobs, has a five-star rating, gets paid $45 an hour, has these 17 software skills. And so I'm starting to say, well, now, why would I just pay for that directly rather than standing in line behind Barbara and Jonas and um, um, you know William all the brokers who are in front of me waiting for Rebecca's time. And so- And oftentimes think, at a fraction of the cost too. Yeah, and so I'm thinking, I, I mean, I make this comment, what happens when I go to your, I'm the agent and you're the broker of record and I come to you and I go, hey Landon, um, I'd like to change my split. And you're like, oh really, would you have in mind? Like, well, I'd like to go to 80-20. And you're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, but I promise not to use Rebecca anymore. I can, I can do better by hiring that work to, directly. And so I think it's going to be very interesting on that front to sort of see how that goes. But there's a, I recently uncovered this little case study. There is an agent 
who is making money in the local commercial estate market using his license and he earns commissions. And you can find this person on LinkedIn. You can see that he's with a very large firm and he's in an urban market. And it's not particularly surprising that with his experience, he appears to be a successful commercial real estate agent generating commissions. At the same time, you can find that same person on Upwork who has a whole list of services that he will provide and has now, because you can see this on Upwork, earned more than $100,000 in Upwork fees. So imagine that Landon by day is earning commercial real estate brokerage fees and Landon by night is providing Excel analysis, demographic maps. Um, one of the people, that one of the big, one of the big plays in the world of Upwork these days, Landon, is what they call SDRs. And those are people that make cold calls for you. Yep. So it's a, it's a whole new ball game in terms of what the gig economy looks like. I could make the case on one hand that it's fantastic because as a user of services, I have options that I never had before. Um, I, I'm a big believer in Gantt charts. And I think as an industry, we could use Gantt charts more effectively, but you can get a Gantt chart done probably three hours at $50 an hour, customized, perfect, exactly fit for the circumstances. So it's $150 tax on working with this particular prospect, but it's so mm -hmm. powerful that it's like, I'll never, I'll never not have a Gantt chart in the deals that I do now because for $150, I have a very compelling tool. Absolutely. So that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big needle mover. And you're absolutely right. And I've, uh, that's an area that I've really explored and dipped my toes into in the last probably 18 months since all this uh, pandemic related stuff's been going on. And, you know, at first I was very skeptical as probably most people are when you are thinking about outsourcing your very valuable tasks to an individual that you've never met, probably never will meet and oftentimes in a different country. But I have been stunned and so consistently impressed by the quality of work that some of these individuals can put out the fact that they specialize means that your work is detailed, fine-tuned, and perfect every single time. And again, you can't ignore the elephant in the room that a lot of the times it's done at a fraction of the cost of what you could get it done for in the States. And that's, I, I've seen the value in my business. I have this constant thing that I believe, which is commercial real estate brokers are the slowest people to adapt to any new technology. But I think the ones who do adapt to that specifically are going to find so much more margin in their business and so much more available time to actually focus on their high income activities than the brokers who are still uh, either, God help the ones that are still doing it themselves or even the ones that have that done in house today. Well, I'll tell you a really interesting story that I think would apply even to your business. So imagine that there's a large uh, retail box that is got about uh, 18 months left on the lease. It's big net lease deal right down, right down Main Street for you, but it's only got 18 months left on the lease. And so the seller uh, wants to sell and is cautioned by an agent like you, like, mm, you're really in kind of a no man's land here with only 18 months left on the lease. The buyer is either going to have to take the chance that the tenant will renew or is going to insist that the renewal takes place now. The tenant, the tenant wasn't uh, willing to do that. And so through the use of gig work, what was discovered by credit card sales information, mm -hmm. that it was a super premium um, retail marketplace as judged by credit card sales with the surrounding retailers. So the buyer stepped forward, suffer, the, the buyer was able to take advantage of about 150 basis points in the cap rate. In other words, let's just say, instead of buying at a six and a half cap, which is what it would be if the lease were in place, bought for an eight cap and said, I'm indifferent whether the tenant renews because I can see, I can see that, you know, it's not about what you can see, it's about what you can't see. And it's, I would gladly take that property to the market based on what I know the surrounding retail strength was. The icing on the cake was when they then overlaid the cell phone data gig worker and it shows that people visit this site three times a week and they stay for 45 minutes. So the buyer actually goes, I want this property and I want to take it to market. The worst thing I, that can happen to me is the tenant renews. 
Right. I remember, you, I think that it was a conversation with James Nelson where you were discussing that. It was a property yeah. in DFW. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. And we actually, um, you know, here at Davis and Young, we've got a lot of bells and whistles. And one of the tools that I'm most enamored with right now is that cell phone tracking data. Because again, I sell net lease properties. And one of the most important things or data points that I can give to a potential buyer on any property is, hey, how well does this store do? And if it's a QSR, sometimes you can get some store sales, but if it's something like automotive or some other general retail, you can't get that data. But with Placer data or other cell phone provider data companies, you can in about 30 seconds, pull a list of every single, um, the example I was using recently was Whataburger. I was able to pull every single Whataburger in the United States, about 820 locations and rank them based off of their uh, at, whether it was weekly, monthly, or annual foot traffic at a location. And, you know, you can't get Whataburger store sales information unless you've got an insider, you know, the tenant really well, but you can make a pretty educated guess with that type of information. And that applies to all sorts of different types of specifically retail real estate. And that's an absolutely valuable data point that you can get. Well, just to kind of put a little topper on that, um, for in, in the book Adapt, I have a little chart of, um, tasks that I took to Upwork to see how many vendors have those keywords in their services. So in other words, if you want to have a market analysis done or a feasibility analysis done, how many for commercial real estate, how many people say that? So there's a chart in the book and shocking how many vendors. And remember, the book was published a year ago and the research was done effectively two years ago. So it, you can assume that it's more than what, if you looked at the table in the book, it would be even stronger than that if you looked at the table at Upwork today. But here's mm -hmm. my point, which is you type in retail market analysis and you look, there's 175 vendors that will do it. And one of the guys who's offering his services was the Chili's guy for the last 20 years. So mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Which is, <laughs> in other words, you're like, yeah, I got to do this market study. Well, what if you could get that market study done by a guy who came out of that industry, not just Johnny wow. the Smart MBA? Wow. Yeah. It adds a whole different component to the, um, the, the, the quality of that information, especially when you're the one having to pitch that information to the next guy. It's a whole new buyer. game. It's a, and, and, wow. and just wow. think, remember, both sides can do that. Wow. That's incredible. Okay. So let's, let's shift again for a minute. So we've talked about um, your books, which are fantastic. We've talked about the technology, uh, the, the most recent years technology and what we're looking forward to in the future. Now let's look for just a minute about brokerage specifically, because all this stuff is what affects what guys like me and guys that you work with do. So you've seen a lot of brokerage. You've seen a lot of the brokerage world from a coaching and advisory perspective, just at its base level in your experience, what makes a top 1% broker today and more specifically, if, if an investor is watching this call, what should an investor be looking for in a broker when they're going to either work with that individual or hire them? Uh, far and away, the number one characteristic of the people that I work with, and I kind of feel like an NBA coach, you know, everybody on the team makes more than me. Everybody that I coach makes a bunch of money. And there's one single reason that they do, which is deep, narrow focus. They have a very specific focus group. They discriminate heavily. In other words, so let's say you're working on net lease properties and someone comes to you and says, hey, um, my buddy is a home builder and he wants to buy 18 acres on the suburbs to, to, to build some new homes and, you're, and, and, and he'll give you an exclusive. He's having such a hard time. You're like, oh, that sounds interesting. Let me run over and do that. And so what I mean by discriminate is it either fits inside the box or it doesn't and it's not gray. When you do that three, four, five, even just three, four, five years, the depth of expertise that you develop will rocket you to top level earnings. Um, so what you will find is that these top brokers are truly experts. Of course, now I can say parenthetically, by the way, that is your best insulation to clients that are also getting smarter and smarter. In other words, the more specialized you are, the more likely you are to be durable. So it's not only more money, but it's more durable money over, over time. Um, again, with very little training, very little onboarding, low barrier to entry, 95% of the brokers out there are opportunists. Um, when you're an opportunist, you have to be a very good athlete. And what I mean by that is you can adapt to a lot of situations. You're good on your feet. Um, but and you may, your ship may come in from time to time. But if you are systematic, and if I said, 
the, the way to do it, Landon, is harvest the same farming area over and over and over again. What happens is every call is valuable because they're either going to transact this year or some year in the future. What I always like to say for a guy like you is like, it's okay, Mr. Jones, it's okay. I need money in 2027 and I'll be here when you need me. Well, when you're an opportunist, you never get to say that. Here's a simple mm -hmm. test. What is your proportion of repeat business? That's a simple test to know whether you're on the right track. Um, if, if all your business is one off and it doesn't categorize very well, then it's just gonna be harder for you. But the people who are killing it and, and doing it repetitively are effectively selling the same properties over and over and over. Now, not technically maybe Valencia Gardens every single time, but all of the properties that are related to it. So every time you talk to the owner of Valencia Gardens, you're always interesting because you traffic in that arena. I'm glad, I'm glad that that's what you said, because that's something that I've recognized as well. And that's why within net lease, you know, there's a couple of particular tenants that I try to focus on. And, you know, I, I know of other net lease brokers across the country who they focus on one particular tenant and one tenant only. The example that I can think of offhand is a, there's a broker out of California or excuse me, Florida, who focuses on Burger Kings alone. She's got every single owner database. She's got their information. She's got a, a whole data set built on these individuals and relationships with them. And she's consistently clearing, you know, this was a year ago, but it was around five, $600,000 gross commissions every single year, just from harvesting that same pool. And I'll tell you another story. And I, I love this story, but it's, uh, it was tough for me at the time. I stepped way out of my lane early on in my career and took on the sale of a hotel out in New Mexico. Now, I don't know if you know a lot about hotel underwriting, because I still to this day don't, but I had to learn a lot of that stuff on the fly. And not only was I a liability on that transaction, but uh, I was also, it took so much time away from my core business that it, it took probably two, three months away from my general prospecting and my, my core work. So I couldn't agree with you more to specialize. And I know we're running short on time here. So I want to ask you one more question and then uh, we'll knock this off. So uh, I'm, I'm a net lease broker. A lot of my clients are all across the country and they own properties all across the country. And one of the things that I like about doing this business is being able to meet people face to face, which with this particular product type is difficult to do, especially over the last 18 months. So how does someone like myself who operates on a national scale, uh, differentiate, differentiate myself and more specifically compete with other brokers who are going after properties, whether they're in my market, they're out of state or anything like that, in your opinion? Well, this is, um, this takes me back to the idea of the top 125. If I were coaching you, Landon, I would say, okay, how many names in your database? And you said, well, I have 4,500 properties and 3,800 owners. I'd say, great. If we could narrow that down to a top 125 and remember that the idea behind the top 125 is three criteria. Does this person control a deal that you want to do? Will the deal happen in the next five years? And are they willing to engage with you? And if I said, I got a list right here of people that meet that criteria. What would you pay me for that list? You're like, wait, you have a list of the 125 deals that are gonna go down in, in my corral? I'd pay anything for that. And so my attitude is, well, why don't you develop that list? Why don't you turn your superpowers onto your roster and say, look, we'll work across a broad basis, but there's 125 that qualify for special treatment. And so what I would say to you in year two, Landon, is, hey, have you put that list together? And you said, yes, I'm, I'm desperately working on that. And I said, well, have you integrated a point system in the top 125 program? I frequently talk about not merely making a high quality touch, but you get one point for calling and leaving a message, three points for having a conversation, five points for meeting in person, and 15 points for meeting in person at the property. So one of the things I would say to you is, so you've been at it now for two, three years. Have you coded in your database, made a user-defined field? How many of these people have you met in person? And you, and you say, well, I don't know. And I said, well, that's not the right answer. What if you figured out where they lived and then made two road trips per year? Because you can hit you can hit Waco, Taos, um, Phoenix, and San Diego in about a three-day gig and pick up 15 people. If you call them and say, look, I know, Mr. Jones, sooner or later, you're going to come to town to, to see your property. What I would love to do, and I'll do this for you, I'll pick you up at the airport, take you to your property, and show you the three things in the marketplace that you need to know about your property. So the idea is, is that you 
dedicate yourself to making that personal connection. In today's world, what I frequently see is, yeah, but I send out, a guy said this to me not too long ago, I sent out 100,000 postcards last year, or, you know, I do 15 blasts a month, um, and, and I have a 22% open rate, and I'd say that's all smoke. In other words, in terms of interacting with people, what have you done to build that personal connection? And, right. you know, particularly, I think, with young people, I sort of see a lot of people who are, they're so social media oriented and they're like, no, I blasted, I blasted. And it's like, that's not the same, especially if your principal is 60 years old, because that's not what I grew up with. Right. And that's different than the way that those people interact. Well, you would ask me how to distinguish yourself in a marketplace where you have many competitors. There's many people that focus on net lease properties, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes intentionally. And sometimes they do it as like, I don't really want to do it, but I got to find the third leg and, you know, I'm in it somehow. And, and, and number one, there's a lot of competitors. Number two, these owners, because it is single tenant at least, can live anywhere. They don't have to come by the property very frequently. Yep. So my suggestion to you is as you make money, reinvest in, in making those personal connections. And so either go visit them, make plans to visit them at a trade association as, if needed, invite them to the trade association. You know, would you come and be a guest at my table or whatever that might be? And you can always use the tack of, hey, I know you come to town at least once a year to check on your property. And when you do, I'll make you this deal. I'll pick you up at the airport, take you to the property, show you the three things I think you need to know about that and drop you off at your hotel. I'll get it done in an hour. No obligation. Just want to make myself available for that. It's pretty hard to turn that down. And I find it to be distinctive. In other words, remember that from their perspective, 90% of the calls they get are, hi, my name is Kevin. There's buyers, buyers, buyers. Do you want to sell? 90% of the calls they get that way. So so you can distinguish yourself just by making it more personal. Absolutely. And I want to ask you a fun question now that you brought that up. So one of my favorite stories from a friend of mine who's also a broker was they, him and his partner were trying to crack the nut that was this developer who was developing, I think it was dollar stores at the time. And no matter what they did, no matter what they tried to do, they couldn't get a meeting with him. They kept getting uh, uh, gate kept by the, the guy's receptionist and it just wouldn't work out. So what they ultimately ended up doing was they went and got this big custom Yeti with the, the individual brand's logo printed on it. And the Yeti was locked and they put a bunch of cool swag inside of the box that, um, of course, he didn't at the time know what it was, but they included a note that said, hey, we want to give you this as a free gift. But in order to get the key to open it, you're going to have to meet with us. Of course, I mean, who's going to turn down that meeting? They got the meeting and they eventually got, I think, a pretty good amount of business from that individual. But give, give me a couple examples, because I know you're going to have plenty of interesting or creative strategies you've seen used to at least break the ice on getting in there with clients? Well, uh, two quick references that your listeners could pick up there. I mentioned this book in in the back of the first book, Thrive. I have a list of books I think you should read. One of those books is a short book and it's called Mr. Schmooze. It's written by a guy named Abraham who um, talks about someone that he knows. So this is one human writing about a real second human And this second human is the guy that he has nicknamed Mr. Schmooze. And it tells the story of how this guy uh, constantly finds way to to distinguish himself by making people feel very special. And so there's lots of stories there that your readers can pick up. Mr. Schmooze, it's S-H-M. Everybody wants to make it S-C-H-M. The second thing I would tell you is there's a guy named Rulin, R-U-H-L-I-N, who was the number one um, Cutco knife salesman in the world. He wrote a book called Giftology, and uh, I encourage you to at least observe his perspective. You may not agree with a a kind of a big gifting program, but he makes his case. He tells a fascinating story about a guy that he was trying to get to. And when the guy came to town, he met him with a Brooks Brothers salesperson who completely outfitted this guy. He was a Brooks Brothers fanatic wow. and spent $6,900 putting this guy in Brooks Brothers clothes. And you can just imagine what that, where the relationship went from there. And so you can listen to that story. There's another reference for you. One of the, one of the things that I talk about in Thrive that I perceive to be underutilized is what I call the power to convene. And what I mean by that is one of the best business developers I know of in this industry uh, used to have an annual summit meeting at a vacation home um, on the on the coast, 
And so he would invite 10 people and they were all players and they would come and then he would kind of lead them through a, a weekend of some wine, cigars, steaks, but also some round tabling. And the idea was that you have to A, pay to get here, but B, we'll take care of you while you're here. But when you come, you have to come with a contributing mindset that you will participate. And I watched that round table become so popular that people were calling mm. him in January and saying, look, I'm trying to schedule my kid's vacation and I need to know when the round table is so I don't miss it. And so I That's think great. what some people do is they get in the mindset of, I have to do this. I have to buy boxed season tickets or I have to take them fishing or things like that. And of course, some of those things work. The construction companies do an amazing job of this, all these kind of fam trips and stuff like that. But what I would tell you is, is that people are drawn to the opportunity to communicate with each other. And so, as you know, I'm having a big summit in November of top players that are coming. Now, my role is pretty small. I'm just going to be interviewing people kind of like you are and trying to pull out stories. But if that summit is successful, they're going to come away with, wow, I learned something. I made new co connections. Well, what about Blaine? What did Blaine get out of that? Well, what I got out of that was he must be somebody if he can convene this kind of crowd. And so... I would really in, uh, encourage the players that are in your world that want to move up a step to think very experiential. What is the Landon experience? And I think we have moved so far over to the social media followers. It's all about that kind of popularity. And yet I saw this uh, round table with 10 people and then 20 people really create lifetime customers. And frankly, my very top performers do fewer deals with a fewer number of people, but make more money. And so I think that comes from a convened strategy. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. That's a lot of good information. And this is definitely going to be one that I'm going to want to go back and watch again to pull out all these good data points. Uh, well, Blaine, this has been a truly fantastic conversation. Um, I saw the, the list of speakers and the attendees for that uh, summit that you've got coming up. I'm really hoping it's something I'm going to be able to attend, but regardless, it's going to be a fantastic event. Um, what's the dates on that again? Uh, it's the afternoon of November 10th and all day on November 11th. Um, there is a link, an Eventbrite link that uh, would be sent out and that has information and um, the registration form. I would just say overall, the idea is to bring top players together where they are contributing and it's sort of 50% content and 50% networking. If it works right, you would be sitting in the audience, you would hear somebody, maybe James Nelson, say something that's interesting and then you'd have the opportunity to cozy up to him at lunch and go, hey, can we talk about that? That's the idea. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's going to be a fantastic event. Uh, Blaine, really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me for a few minutes here on a multitude of different, very interesting sub subjects. Uh, for the folks watching at home, where can the, the viewer of this go to get more information on you? The easy place, I think, really is uh, my website, which is www.hbs. Those are my initials, H. Blaine Strickland, HBS, and then a dash, and then resources.com hbs-resources.com. I've got a coaching platform, which is www.onemoredeal.net. And that's a place where I've stored a lot of resources. So people that want to move directly to resources, that's where they're stored and all the information is there as well. Of course, you can find the two books on Amazon as well. And if you type in Thrive Blaine Strickland or Adapt Blaine Strickland, Kindle, hardcover, audiobook, it's all there. And I could not recommend those books more. Well, excellent. Well, everybody, that's our conversation. I appreciate you tuning in. Be sure to uh, go to Blaine's websites, check out his great content, read the books. Also subscribe to NetLease Beast on YouTube for more videos like this, as well as our weekly newsletter, uh, of course, catered toward the NetLease investor. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Landon. I really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you.